Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Let's Survive Interviews. Uh, I am delighted today to be joined by a guy that my, my wife reminded me to get on the show, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a bit. But uh, today I am joined by actor, filmmaker, and gigantic writer, <laughs> so much, uh, and gigantic games enthusiast, Graham Skipper. Welcome, Graham. Hello! Thanks for having me on. It's fun to be here. Uh, Graham, I never get tired. You know, I hear your voice on about eight podcasts that I listen to, and I never get tired of hearing it. <laughs> uh, thank you. You know, it's funny. I, I, ever since this quarantine hit, I have never been so busy with podcast appearances. Uh, and it's, it's really fun because I just get to, like, talk to my friends about stuff. But at the same time, I'm going, I hope people don't get, like, sick of me, like, just talking about movies and shit all the time. Uh, so that makes me happy that you're not totally sick of me yet. No, because I, I, I love listening to screen drafts and you come on and you just, you and Billy Ray will come on and just burn the, burn the house down. Just set fire <laughs> to burn rain. it all to the ground. <laughs> um, I'm glad you like that podcast. I, I love that podcast. It's really, uh, it's always really fun to go on there and, and uh, who doesn't love good list, you know? Oh, exactly. I, and it's so funny because uh, I'm a big fan, uh, big fan of Clay and Ryan. And then when I was at Panic Fest in January, uh, yeah, January, I met Beth Crudell and we're talking and I'm telling <laughs> her about my favorite podcasts and I say screen drafts and she's like, oh, like Clay is my roommate. I was like, <laughs> the world is genuinely so small. So it's small. It's so tiny. <laughs> it's so <laughs> tiny. Yeah. But today we're here to talk to you, Graham, about uh, video games and kind of, well, I, I, the channel is very horror game focused, but I, I'm, I'm up for talking about all kind of games. But the reason, uh, to get back to my story at the start, I was trying to pick out guests for the show and I said, you know, this person, this person, my wife said, what about Graham Skipper? And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. I know Graham's into games because me and you had actually just been talking about the Final Fantasy VII remake on Facebook. And then... Oh, uh, it suddenly clicked to me. I was like, wait a minute. His movie Sequence Break is legitimately about an arcade machine that murders people. <laughs> so I was like, no better person <laughs> for this uh, this show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I love games. I've always been a gamer. Uh, I, I uh, uh, gosh, I mean, my first system was the NES back you know, gosh, it would have been around like probably 1990, you know? Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've, I've always loved video games. Um, I, I used to really love like when my parents would go to the movies, you know, they'd go see an R rated movie and then I would, you know, they would say, well, either you can hang out here in the lobby while we're in the movie, or you can like, I'll buy you a ticket for like a G film and you can go like there you know, and see that movie. And I would always say, well, let me hang out in the lobby and play the arcade games. Because, you know, <laughs> in our local movie theater, you know, there was a whole section with just arcade games. Um, so that's what I do. They go see a movie and for two hours, I would just hang out by myself and play arcade games in the lobby. And it was great. Um, this was back in the day when kids could do such things. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I've, I've always been a big gamer and, and I've always been drawn to horror games. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I, I'm not often scared by horror movies anymore um and for a lot of my life i was you know after i got really into horror i would not often find myself scared by horror movies i would like enjoy them but horror games consistently are like pretty fucking scary to me oh. I, I still get tense i'm like logging in to play a game and it's there's something about that that's like still affecting to me and you know i'm still sort of it helps me chase that dragon, you know? <laughs> I, it's funny because that's exactly the reason that I kind of started this channel and, and stuff was, I'm, I'm exactly the same. We go to a lot of festivals, we see a lot of movies, and nine times out of ten when you're at a horror festival, you're almost, unless you're watching something pretty harrowing, you're like cheering for like, oh, the cheerleader's head got cut off, whatever, you know? Uh, whereas yeah. I find that like I played Layers of Fear here on the channel and it, there's a highlight reel of me just screaming and just freaking yeah. out, <laughs> um, yeah. which does not happen to me with, with uh, movies anymore either. Not, well, very, very rarely. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I, not too long ago, I, I still have my original copy of Silent Hill and I have an old PlayStation and I, the, you know, I don't know, this is a few months ago. I just said, I'm going to play it again. You know, let's, you know, I'll just play it. And from the second I turned it on, it was just so like kind of tense and it was really scary. And, and um, 
you know, and, and it was, it was still a, a fun experience, you know, and a challenging experience. Uh, but it just made me go, man, you know, here's a game that, that I played a number of times before and it came out, you know, a couple decades ago. Uh, and it's still just as affecting to me now as it was when I was 12. I, it's so cool because uh, of the guests I've had on, both you and Andy Stewart both recently pulled out the old Silent Hill and played it, which I think yeah. I think this tells us that we are definitely pining for a new Silent Hill, though, as well. Like, because Resident and, Evil's getting all this love. And yes, it's like... yes. I would play the shit out of a new Silent Hill. I, um, I, I played the last, last one I played was, uh, I guess, four? Oh, The Room. No, after that. Uh, no, no, it was... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, no, it was the room. Yeah, that's the one where, yeah, she's locked in the room, then there's the door chained shut. Yeah, it's number four. Yeah, that was the last one I played. Yeah. Um, and I loved it. It was great. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, Silent Hill 3, I have a soft spot for because there was one day, uh, yes. it was over the Easter break, I remember, in college, and, uh, me and a couple of my roommates had stayed home over Easter break. And, and so we were like, what are we going to do? And I said, why don't we, I just bought Silent Hill three. And I said, why don't we play this game? Like start to finish. Let's just play it. Let's just do it. And so we stayed up, you know, and just played it straight. And we, you know, the three of us would like kind of take turns and if somebody would die, we, you know, the other person would take over. And, uh, and so we played Silent Hill three in, in essentially one sitting. Uh, and that was great. Um, but I always loved that one. I loved the mall and I loved like how searching the, the like back corridors in the mall slowly turned into like hell. And um, I love that series so much. I'm so happy to hear you say this because like a lot of people, and I totally understand it, right? There's a difference between understanding something and agreeing with it. I, I understand that objectively Silent Hill 2 is the best of the series, but I personally, yeah. subjectively, 3 is my favorite. Um, so yeah. I, just, I love hearing somebody else share that opinion. For me, it was uh, me and my best friend were playing it. It's a very similar story to you, but we actually were so scared by it. I was about 16, 17 at the time. We were so scared by it that it was like literally when we were going to the bathroom, it was like, here, you stand outside the toilet and just like talk to me so that I know I'm safe. <laughs> like, that's <just> scared <laughs> yes. <me> <laughs> See, see, that's how it was for me and my friends when I got Resident Evil 2 for the first time. Um, I was in high school, probably a freshman, so maybe I was 13 or 14, you know? Mm. Um, well, how old are you when you're a freshman in high school? 14 or 15, I guess? And um, somehow, one of my friends had figured out how to, uh, how to put what was on, like, one TV in our house on you know i had a, like a little bitty like old tube tv in my in my bedroom yeah and somehow one of my tech friends you know had figured out oh well if i plug this thing into here then i can actually show what you're playing down here in the living room on your tv upstairs and so i was having a sleepover and this was new technology right Whoa, so like yeah. everybody like, i want to see resident evil 2 <laughs> you know but some people were up in my bedroom hanging out watching on the tv and i was playing with a couple of my friends down in the living room and I'll never forget, like, you know, I'm sitting there playing and I'm like freaking out. And then, and then uh, it was that first time when all the zombie arms reach out, you know, they do the, the, they do the Romero like jump scare. Oh, yeah. um, and, and I heard from my bedroom upstairs, all my like tough friends go, ah! you know, and scream. <laughs> and freak out. It was um, so much fun. Oh man. Yeah, like It was great. Uh, speaking about actually Resident Evil and stuff, I mean, as I say, me and you actually talked a lot about on, on Facebook about the Final Fantasy remake, but have you checked out yeah. the, the Resident Evil 2, 2 remake, the Resident Evil 3 remake? You know, I haven't. I haven't yet. I, I've, uh, I fully admit that I have fallen deeply into the Animal Crossing cult. Um, <laughs> you and Graham Resnick both. <laughs> oh my God, I know. I haven't visited his island yet. I want to. Me uh, too. I'm, Oh my God. I'm really, I'm really deep into the cult. I, uh, just today, I, I, a friend of mine, uh, was, was buying turnips for 505 a turnip and I was selling everything. Um, and, and this is the nerdiest conversation I've had in quite a while. Uh, my wife is shaking her head at me and just not <laughs> understanding anything about this. Um, yeah, but it's, uh, uh, that, that's what I've sort of, uh, fallen into. Um, 
I've tried to, in recent years, I mean, one, you know, just because they're so expensive, but two, just because I remember growing up, this was always the thing is like, it's so easy for us to, to get video games now and to like buy a whole bunch of them and then never play them. Oh yeah. Um, that for me, I'm, I'm really trying to, like, if I buy a game, I'm going to play it and I'm going to play it through to the end and then I'll buy the next one, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I, I, uh, so that's why I haven't played the Resident Evil remakes yet. I'm really curious to, I replayed Resident Evil 2, I think it was two years ago. I, d- I did a full replay of it, um, which I mean, granted is only like eight hours, but it, uh, but it was great. It was super fun. Um, so I think maybe that's why I was resistant, but I mean, I haven't played Nemesis in a really long time. Mm. Uh, and I hear that one's great. Um, but I want to get back into that. I, I want to get back into uh, Friday the 13th. Um, I haven't uh, played that in a long time, but but when that first came out, I was playing that online quite a bit. Um, yeah. yeah, I know. It's I got to get back into my horror game. Like I'm, I've, I've been, I, 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 I dove straight into Final Fantasy VII, and then as soon as I got out of that, I went and joined Animal Crossing, and I'm <laughs> lost in that world now. <laughs> they're they are time sink games though like they are games that will devour your uh, life <laughs> i mean i'll be up all night long and like my wife will wake up and it'll be like 6 a.m and she'll be going what are you doing and i'm like i've got to rebuild my apple orchard <laughs> you know i gotta pick these weeds <laughs> like you're I've heard Crazy. that there's pe- I've heard that there's people that have been playing Animal Crossing so much that they're like walking. This is a genuine thing. They're like when they're walking down the street, they see weeds and they're like, "Shit, should I pull those?" Like because I know, <laughs> dude, dude. We have we have butterflies in our backyard. We have a plant that attracts butterflies. And every time I see one, I'm like, "Why well, she got my net?" Oh, I can't. Uh, that's right. It's real life. And yeah, same here. Whenever whenever presents with balloons fly over my house, I'm like, "Where's my slingshot?" But sadly. I know. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. Uh, but yeah, actually, I think you may have kind of, well, no, I, I don't know if you've answered this yet, but uh, what would you say, okay, well, what was the first game you remember scaring you? Like, really scaring you? Uh, that is a good question. Probably, it was either the Friday the 13th Nintendo game. It was one of three, okay, I'll give you three options, and I'm not sure which one it was. It was either the Friday the 13th Nintendo game, or it was the Jekyll and Hyde Nintendo game. Um, and I think both of those were primarily scary because I knew what the subject matter was and because of the title screen. Mm-hmm. Um, the first game that I remember really scaring me in a way uh, was Tempest, um, the arcade oh, game. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, and, and, and it's weird to say that because there's not really a story to Tempest. It's, you know, it's just a shooter, but, um, the graphics of it and the sound of it, it's its just kind of unsettling, you know? Like, you're hmm. you are essentially like a, a sort of spider-like um, vehicle around yeah. the edge of, like, a black hole, and you're having to, to go, you know, crawl around the edge of the black hole and shoot stuff in, and then when you progress, you move through the black hole. And I remember it was in my movie theater arcade. They had one of those, and for whatever reason, it always scared me. And, and I'm not sure why, um, aside from just it being kind of generally unsettling and like the imagery being kind of weird and it just kind of having this sort of nihilistic like vibe to it. Mm. Um, but but uh, yeah, Tempest, I remember really scaring me and, and that's why I, I modeled uh, the gameplay sequences and sequence break are modeled off of Tempest. Um, that was what I sent our, our, our designer, our game designer, that I just said make it like Tempest because that always really freaked me out. It's really funny because like I wouldn't have drawn that parallel watching sequence break just just out of context but hearing you say it I'm suddenly like obviously seeing Tempest in my head and it's making perfect sense um, but I love that that you drew from like something that genuinely kind of chilled you. I think that's what we all do when we write stuff is you pull from your the stuff that really scared yeah. the the life out of you but that's so cool uh, to kind of have that insight about but also something that i've noticed is you definitely seem uh even just judging by sequence break you seem drawn to like arcades and arcade but as you say you spent a lot of your 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 youth kind of in them so uh yeah yeah you know arcades were really um 
you know, there's something about an arcade that's different from having a home console, you know, like you're going to a place where you're going to be essentially facing off against other people, you know, like, like when you're at home, you're sort of the master of your domain, right? Like mm. I had the high score on my NES, you know, playing Zelda, like, like that nobody could touch it and I, because I was the only one playing it unless like a friend came over and obviously they weren't going to do it. But then you go to a, <laughs> like you go to an arcade and like, you know, even if you played street fighter before, Oh shit, look at that guy. That guy's really good at it. And somehow, I don't know, like before the world of online gaming and everything, it was like this weird communal experience that was also vaguely, um, you know, competitive uh, uh, of being in the arcades. And it was also like the symbol of sort of being old enough to be separated from your parents for a while. You know, because yeah. like we'd go to the mall and my parents would drop me off at the arcade and they'd go shop for three hours and they'd just give me like, you know, my dad would hand me like 20 bucks and say, have fun. And, and you've got to like, you know, navigate like the social structures of like, if you're a 12 year old kid and there's like an 18 year old kid, like you got to like figure that out. And I don't know, it was just sort of a major part for me of life and, and of growing up and. And I loved those games so much. The other thing too that I think is important is that when you grow up and you have home consoles, um, arcade games are always like better and are always yeah. more high tech and are always more, more unique, you know? And so you're always Definitely. wishing that, that you could play that game at home, but you never could. Um, and so there was something I think about that too, that, that just really uh, drew me to, to arcades and to the arcade experience. And I, I'm lucky that I live in LA where we have a lot of arcades. Um, but I, but I wish that it were more than just like, you know, barcades, which are a major thing now. Like, yeah, I wish that it were a thing where still, like if you go to the mall, like where people could hang out in an arcade and kids could have that experience of kind of being on their own for a little while and, and, you know, having to manage your own money and like do shit like that. Like mm. it's, it was a growing up experience for me. And I, I, I miss it and I loved it. And, and, you know, even just seeing an arcade machine today just makes me feel warm and fuzzy. I, I love hearing this because obviously, right, I'm, I'm from Ireland and uh, we did not have what I would call like a large amount of uh, arcades or that kind of stuff. Now, in saying that, in Limerick, just, just like down the road from where I live, there was two arcades uh, and one was called the Victoria Club. And it was kind of, it was very shady, very dodgy. You were fully sure that you may be stabbed uh-huh. in there. <laughs> but again, what you said about like having to navigate social structures and go, okay. And that was the one that our parents told us, like, you're not allowed to go there. So that was the one we wanted to go to. They had Tekken. Oh, yeah, but, sure. You know? Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah, then, this one has Mortal Kombat too. I want to go to that one. Like, um, And then the other one was like the more... <laughs> The more kid-friendly one, but at the same time, there, it kind of had this air of, of uh, there's a lot of strange older <laughs> men inside this arcade. So it was like <laughs> a very scary, it was like, we can either go to the one where we might be killed, or we can hang around in this one where I'm not quite sure yes. what will happen. But as you say, yeah. I, I love what you just said, because I do, in a weird way, I think that we are holding, to some extent, kids back from that experience of having to figure out their surroundings and understand like the potential dangers of pissing someone off as well in a relatively yeah. safe environment surrounded by other kids and other adults, you know? Uh, yeah. 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 It's, you know, it's hard. And like, I don't have kids, so I don't really have a, you know, I, I, I can't really say this with any authority, but I just feel like, you know, there's so much that's, that's about like protecting kids right now. And there was something about the arcade for me growing up where the fact that I just, I was alone and I know that I was alone because we didn't have cell phones. Right. So yeah. like short of me going to the security office and saying, I want my mommy. Like I wasn't going to see my mom for three hours. I yeah. knew that that was, she was going to be gone. So I had to deal with everything, you know? And, and if I ran out of my quarters, well, I, you know, so be it. I was fucked, you know? And so I better be good at what I'm doing, you know? And if yeah. I'm, if I'm going up and I'm challenging some kid to street fighter, you know, well, 
I better be confident in how I'm going to approach this and I better be brave to do this if I want to, you know, it's just, there's a lot of layers to that. And you don't really get that when you have somebody like over your shoulder or if you're in your living room. I feel like it's, it's also become something that like people are, are definitely nostalgic for or pining for. Cause even when you watch stranger things or something, I think a lot of people of that, that generation are looking at it going, God, remember those days when we just spent six to eight hours playing Qbert or playing dragons yeah. or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, uh, in ter- so right, you're, you're a filmmaker and, and an actor and everything as well. Um, what would you say are some of your favorite video game movie adaptations? Oh, good question. Um, well, so I'm a fan of the Resident Evil series. Uh, uh, Re- Resident Evil 1 is definitely the best one. Um, 2 is also pretty good. Um, I, I, I really like all of them. I mean, they're like total cheese ball, like, you know, action adventure fair, but they're fun. Um, I really love, you know, speaking of Paul W.S. Anderson, I really love his Mortal Kombat. Um, yes. That might be the best mm. video game adaptation. Um, I just think it captures what the game is, which is dumb action idiocy, <laughs> but like it does a good job of it. Uh, you know, um, I really like Detective Pikachu. Um, that's that's a video game adaptation, and I think it's a really great movie. Um, I'm looking over at my DVD shelf, trying to think <laughs> what what else I might be missing. I mean, it's tough, right? Because like, not included with that would be like The Last Starfighter, which I think is a great movie, but it's not directly an adaptation of a video game. Yeah. Um, but I I think you know. I'm- on the video, I, I don't want to give a spoiler away about it, but on you do bring that up, I believe, on one on the video game movie screen drafts episode, if I'm not mistaken. Screen drafts, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So on the screen drafts episode, it was about it was it was about movie. It was about movies about, about games. games, yeah, uh, about games. So we actually had talked about before that doing what if we did like movies based on video games, but then. Uh, I think Bria sort of wasn't as into that idea, uh, <laughs> understandably, because uh, yeah. you got to really have a certain, <laughs> a certain uh, love for that kind of movie. Um, but I mean, like, I, I, I don't know. I find video game movie adaptations kind of fascinating because, like, when you look at, you know, the, the most famous one, right, the Super Mario Brothers movie, and you look at how ridiculous that movie mm-hmm. is, when you think about it from a creative standpoint, at least when I do, and I go, I go, okay, what would I have done? if tasked with adapting this story about a plumber and his brother who are in a land inhabited by giant mushrooms and like dinosaur monsters, you know, like how am I going to adapt this into a movie? I don't know that I would have done better than what they did. And I love that they went weird, you know, say, like you got to go. I think like, that that's- I like that. Sorry, I think that it has developed like a cult status over time because it is not, it's not cutesy, it's not kitsch, it's not what you would expect from a Nintendo movie. It is a dark, yeah. weird, Cronenbergian film. It's so weird when the guy, when it's the guy with like the, you know, human body and the big broad shoulders and the little tiny dinosaur head. <laughs> like, it's weird. It's, it's super weird. weird. Especially if you're a kid, like I was, going to see that in the theater and walking in expecting Super Mario Brothers and that's what you get. That's weird. And yeah, it's funny weird. because I remember, I, I, I think it was for my 12th birthday, I went to the cinema and got a ticket for something, but then snuck into Mortal Kombat and watched that instead. That and Spawn back to back, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great double feature. Oh, well, it was. I remember being, for a 12th birthday. My birthday is New Year's Eve, so it's always an event as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of, I remember on a New Year's Eve sitting there and watching Mortal Kombat and Spawn back to back and just being like, I feel so grown up right now. <laughs> I've yeah, seen I so much blood today. That's like the greatest birthday ever. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, that's funny. And, yeah, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's weird. Uh, kind of, okay. I, I, I no, I'm not going to ask that because I don't like negativity. I was going to ask what's your least favorite game adaptation, but I don't like putting negativity out there. So instead, I will ask if you could, if you could adapt a video game tomorrow, like is in, you know, if they said pick whichever franchise you want, any game you want, 
and make your own movie out of it, what do you think you, is the movie you would feel most comfortable making? 100% Echo the Dolphin. <gasps> really? 100%. Uh, I would want to make the Echo the Dolphin movie. That, that is like the easiest answer ever. I, I have loved that game always. Um, I think that franchise is bonkers. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the original game itself is so weird. You know how you're oh, yeah. like, it's just like a, sort of a leisurely time, like hanging out as a, as a dolphin. And then, and then slowly but surely you, you know, encounter an ancient alien civilization in the deep abyss at the bottom of the ocean. Like, it's amazing. Um, so I would want to just, I, man, if I had all the money in the world and could just adapt anything, give me Echo the Dolphin. I would go crazy. with Like, I'd go, I, I would go like Cronenberg, Lynch, Ken Russell with an oh Echo the Dolphin. Oh my God. I just, look, like... Maybe you could ask uh, Patrick, uh, Casey, and Josh Miller for any insights into Sega. Just be like, "Hey, guys, right? I've, I've got <laughs> yeah. a, I've got a pitch." <laughs> Man, of if if you had given me like five years and and all the guesses in the world, I would not have guessed that. And I, I'd love when that happens because um, I I love the Echo oh, yeah. of Dolphins series. Uh, I it's the the one on the Dreamcast is the only game that's ever made me put a chair through a wall. I got so angry at the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel that. I feel that. I know. They're so hard. They're needless so hard. hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You heard it here first, people. Graham Skipper is doing the Echo of the Dolphin trilogy. <laughs> I'm doing the Echo of the Dolphin movie. Yeah, that's happening. Uh, oh, my God. Can oh, you imagine? No. Oh. I, I oh, love that crazy. answer. Um, and actually, you know what? It's really funny because you would not think, okay, this is a horror game show. But like, when I think of it, there's stuff in Echo the Dolphin that is actually, if you, if you take it outside, as you say, right, it's like you're just swimming around as a dolphin, mundane life. But then if you think of any horror arc, then you get ripped out of your comfort zone, in this case, by a tornado in the sky that pulls you out of the sea and drops you somewhere else or whatever. Yeah. And then everything suddenly becomes super weird. And as you say, there's aliens and monsters in the deep. It's like, it's like H.R. Giger, like <laughs> HR, like ancient alien H.R. Giger shit at the bottom of the ocean. Like that first time when you swim way down and you see that huge like base right there, it's fucking terrifying. It's so weird. It's so traumatic, and it's not what you expected of, Se- of Sega at that gener- in that generation. Well, no, because you bought that game, or your parents bought that game for you with the picture of, like, a happy dolphin, you know, with palm trees. <laughs> and you're going, what? what is happening right now? And all I can do is, like, headbutt you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I just, I love some of the conversations that I've had so far in this. I love, like, how... <laughs> how things come around uh in in my interview the other day we compared uh what did we compare we compared god of war to maniac mansion and today we've decided that echo Dolph- the dolphin is a hr well we've established that echo the dolphin is a hr geiger influence we've established that he is yes <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah. um, i like that i like that god of war maniac mansion comparison that's good Good. That's good. Uh, the main reason behind it was actually just just quickly. It, it was to do with the fact that God of War, the new God of War, you don't have to have played the originals to get it. But if you do, you'll get this kind of like nostalgic kick of like, oh, I understand what that's about. Oh, I get that. I'm I'm behind the the curtain on this kind of. But and it was the same with with uh, Day of the Tentacle. When you played Day of the Tentacle, if you had played Maniac Mansion, you were like, oh, I know what's going on here. Um, so yeah, it was just that little yeah, insight. Uh, uh, so uh, okay, so question for you. Ooh, yes. Ooh, uh, speaking of like Day of the Tentacle and, and Maniac Mansion, did you ever play a game called Out of This World? Oh yes, the the really the guy who did Flashback, the the game that was before that. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're like it starts with the guy that like has the weird hologram like computer. Yeah. And then he gets like transported to another world. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like those kind of big beasts running after you and stuff across the. You, yes. You're looking from a distance. You're just seeing you run away from this shapeless polygon monster. <laughs> yeah. 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 That game always scared. I had that game. That game always scared me a lot. Um, but it just reminds me of that era of sort of like point and click adventures. 
And and I remember getting that game going, oh, it's like a point and click adventure. It'll be fine. And then going, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> oh, shit. I think a lot of those games at that time as well were super hard because you you got games so infrequently that you needed a game to last. But I think that also added to the horror factor yeah. of it was that like when you were playing out of this world, there was moments where, you, where like you can just die in an instant. It's not like Sonic where yeah. you lose your rings or Mario where you lose your mushroom. It's like, no, no, no. You make one mistake. Just one. It was mm. the Dark Souls of its time. Like, it was, Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> totally. totally. Um, it was also like 13 floppy disks. I remember yeah. that. It was like a whole stack of floppy disks. <laughs> yes. I do, because I, even like the original Prince of Persia was the same. You had to like put in one after the other like for ages. Yeah. You play, you play for like 15 minutes and then you'd like pop the new one in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I'm kind of curious now as well. Uh, in terms of kind of like like... Actually, I don't want to get too much into Sequence Break because what I'd love for anybody watching this to do is hop on over to Shudder uh, and check out Sequence Break because it's well worth watching, especially if you're a fan of, of horror games. Even though it's not a game and it's not technically a movie even it, about, about a real game, it's, it's about the, how... I, I'm going to get into all kinds of spoilers. I'm not going to stop. Um, but it's, I think you'll, you'll get a <laughs> hell of a kick out of it because it does connect a lot to... I feel us as gamers nowadays and, and uh, yeah. And Chase Williamson's fantastic in it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I agree. Chase is wonderful. Uh, yeah. It's thank you very much. I'm yeah. Uh, uh, if you're, if you're a gamer, you know, this is a movie made for horror gamers. Like I think, I think you'll, I think you'll appreciate it. And I think that perhaps it'll speak to you uh, in how we are all, drawn to our video games in a way that others might not quite understand. And it's funny because uh, I think, I can't remember if you brought this up on that Screen Drafts episode you were on. I imagine it must have come up, but like, you're a big horror fan and you're a big gamer. Do you remember when you first saw Existence? Uh, yeah. Um, first time I saw Existence would have been in college. Uh, that was where I saw most of my Cronenberg um yeah. and uh you know I'll be honest like my, my relationship with existence has always been that I, I really like that movie a lot I remember when I first saw it I felt like it was sort of Videodrome light um you know that it was it was kind of like Videodrome with video games and it didn't quite uh hit me as hard as Videodrome did um that said uh you know when I was developing uh, sequence break. I hadn't seen Existence in a very long time, and I rewatched it, um, and I was I was uh, you know really impressed uh, just with with how impactful that movie is. And of course, Cronenberg is like one of our great master directors, you know. And he's mm. um, and and so it's it goes without saying that anything that he creates is going to be um, uh, impactful and really you know uh, sort sort of vital. But um, yeah, I, I I like Existence quite a bit. I think that it has some really excellent um, special effects in it. And I like what it says about the idea of like immersive video gaming and how we get lost in it. Um, yeah. And yet again, as with a lot of what Cronenberg does, you know, he was able to find sort of the, the, uh, the I don't know what you'd call it, like the, the dividing line between like new and old technology and kind of figure out a way to like make a comment on it. And I think, and, and often be like ahead of his time when he was making that comment. And I think that that's what he was doing with existence was I think that he, he was a little bit ahead of his time, like sort of in anticipating like online video gaming and like virtual reality. Um, and, and, and also kind of like fanaticism, you know, that, that I think is a major part of that movie. Um, but yeah, I probably saw it first in college, I think. I feel like everything you've just said there describing existence and what Cronenberg was trying to say also describes World of Warcraft in the early 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I was just thinking of a question there, which is, right, you are you're trapped in a horror video game, right? Uh, all right? We all are actually technically right now. But anyway, you're trapped in a horror video game. Oh, yeah. And you have, you have three friends yeah. that can join your multiplayer party to help get you out of it. Who are you bringing? Who's gonna help you escape this this Ooh. nightmare? God, oh, man! And these are real these are real 
Oh, they could be in real life. I'm like calling, calling them in from play. Like you could have Joe Bigos on one side and Kratos on the other. It's fine. Like, and to be honest, they're very similar. It's fine. Interesting. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> right. Interesting. Okay. So I'm in a horror video game. Um, I'm, gosh, I'm probably going to call in. I'm probably going to call him Barrett from Final Fantasy VII to be my tank. Um, he's gonna he's gonna be the one smashing down doors and taking all the hit points. Um, then I'll probably call in like gosh, this is really tough. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I I would uh, no, it's good. I like it. I'm I'm trying to think. You know, I I call in Kirby. Because I feel like Kirby's pretty oh unstoppable. God, yes. You know, Kirby pretty, like, no matter what you're facing, Kirby just fucking eats it. And um, then turns into it. Yeah, and he can fly. <laughs> and then he turns into it. Like, no matter how scary anything is, like, Kirby's going to be able to do it. So, yeah, I'd say I'd see Barrett and Kirby, <laughs> and then, and, and then, you know, no offense to any of my actual living friends, but I'm definitely going to call my video game friend. Um... And, and, and then, and then I'd, I guess I'd, I'd like call in, huh, I guess I'd call in like, <laughs> like, like my character from Skyrim and I can't remember his name now because I haven't been on it in a long time, but that dude is stacked. He's jacked. Like that guy is covered in dangerous armor. He's got all, he's got, you know, you can summon four Storm Atronachs at a time. He's like, he's going to be able to do whatever he wants so he can take some dragon barehanded so so i'm gonna have him with me too oh i that is so awesome like i can't wait to just drop in images of you know barrett kirby <laughs> and, a, and the skyrim viking men <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i i think as well if 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 this the skyrim viking guy wasn't available you you could just call joe bigos you'd be fine as well um, I just called you. Well, he just, he just come in and he uses similar to how the 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 dragonborn can use the uh, uh, the the you know the the Dovahkiin, uh language to to cause horrible <laughs> horrible violence. Uh, I think Joe has his own Dovahkiin language that he can use uh, to to level cities and level monsters. Yes. Oh, uh, I I the, one of the reasons I was bringing Joe up though is that uh, actually on my layers of fear playthrough. I did call out Bliss. Now, uh, you were in Bliss, uh, and you're also in VFW, uh, but I, I have raved about Bliss almost daily since I saw it at Fright Fest. Uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I've met so many friends at festivals over our mutual love of Bliss, and even getting to oh, that's meet good. That's great. <laughs> even getting to meet Joe then a couple of times on the festival circuit as well has been great. And, you know, when I met him at Fry Fest Glasgow again, so, you know, it was nice to kind of, he remembered me and we, we kept the conversation going. And I love VFW as well. And to be honest, both of those feel like they'd make amazing video games. Um, sure, yeah. VFW would be a badass beat-em-up brawler, like side-scroller, Streets of Rage. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I love that idea. I love that. Is there anybody uh, out there that can make one of those? Like, who makes those? <laughs> Actually, make which, that which, I mean, we may have already answered the question, but is there any um, movie out there that you would love to see adapted into a game? Gosh, interesting. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'll say this, is that, my, 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 well, my dream for a while has been to, to create the game that we have in Sequence Break into an actual game. Um, I always thought that would be totally cool. And we, so when we were developing the game that was going to so be in the movie, we, you know, had rules, you know, rules for it and the ideas for everything. So we could do that. We just haven't really had the opportunity. I think in terms of movies, like I would love to see, like imagine, imagine, right? Like a PlayStation 1 era, you know, tank controls game that was Halloween H2O, you know? Oh my God. Like, like survival horror sort of like, but PlayStation 1 era, you know? So yeah, like yeah. very, you know, very, you know, square polygons. I think that would be really fun. It would be like um, Clock Tower. Yes, totally. Yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah, it's like you can't really do anything. You just kind of have to run away. Um, 
Um, but I think that would be really cool. Like, I'd love to see somebody, you know, take, like, all those, like, lesser, in, not lesser entries, but, like, lesser known or lesser, like, adapted entries in a franchise and do something with them. Mm. Um, you know, like, I've, I've, I love um, Super Mario Maker on, oh, on oh, uh, yeah. uh, the Switch. And I've always thought, like, oh, man, could you ever do, like, a fun adaptation of, like, you know, like a like all the Friday the 13th games, but in different levels on Super Mario Maker, you know, like, how do you do that? Because I think that that's something that would be really fun um, to, to to see what people could do with it, because, like, all we really got, like, you know, like, like we got the Friday the 13th NES game, which was, I think, really interesting and innovative, not really fun and way too hard. Um, I really like the Nightmare on Elm Street game for the NES, um, you know, but like, like, and like we got a Texas Chainsaw game for the Atari, which I don't know if you've ever played that one. I've never but, played that, no. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Oh my God. So I had a, I had a ROM for it on my computer because it's the only way I've been able to figure out how to play it. Um, but you're, you're literally playing as Leatherface and you just run around chainsawing people. Like that's all you do, you know? It's like, how did this game get past like any sort of, governing body like how was this game happening this was at the time um, when the censors were going crazy with horror movies and they're like oh yeah but it's yeah. fine for leatherface to hack people up <laughs> like, yeah it's oh my god um but yeah i think I, I think that might be my answer is like you know and and i just love the playstation one era of games too because you know they they were like advanced right but they were still kind of primitive enough to you know, like with the early Resident Evil games, like, you know, the tank controls and stuff like yeah. that. Like, I think just kind of added to the experience I, of, like, making the game difficult, you know, and making yeah. it scary because of that. I'm a huge uh, fan of fixed camera angles and tank controls. Um, I think that as much as I like the newer, like, over-the-shoulder horror games, I feel like the second you're over the shoulder, you are in control of everything. You, If you don't want to see what's around the corner, you can just turn around and look the other way. Whereas when it was fixed camera angles, you had to look at what the they were showing you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Totally. Totally agree. Um, yeah. And so I've actually, I mean, I, I play a lot of uh, old games still, like, you know, uh, retro games. But every so often I'll get sent a game or I'll check out a game that you know is a modern game, but it has like the old school tank controls and and stuff. And those really blow my mind because I'm like, it's so good that in, it's like in horror films, right? Uh, in the indie circle, there's people like, like you making unique stuff that studios wouldn't touch with a 50 foot pole. And then like, but just because that's the nature of the industry and it's similar with games. There's these little guys that are, are out making these, like loving recreations or not even recreations, but like lovingly done re imaginings of these old PlayStation one style games. And I'm like, thank God for the indies, man. Thank mm -hmm. God. Or else we would just be playing the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. And I agree. Yeah. I love, you know, periodically just like searching through like PlayStation store or whatever and seeing what indie games are out there for like one, two or $3, you know, and, and, you know, what am I willing to spend to, try something new out and sometimes you sometimes you know sometimes you find some like really cool little gems um uh i agree with you i think that that it's uh it's it's just so cool that we live in an era right now where you know people are are going to be you know are, are able to make these games like for cheap by themselves without needing to have like a big studio behind them which i think is why after this quarantine we're gonna see a boom of games Oh, I think that right now people are making a shit ton of cool games and I think we're about to see a lot of a lot of that. I totally agree cuz there's there's even been some interesting crossover. I mean, I, I uh, in between games and movies that I've noticed lately like the Dread X collection, like Dread Central have basically created 10 small horror games uh from 10 developers made in a week. And I'm looking at that kind of stuff and I'm going, okay, there is we we've always kind of known that there is this th that the video game world and the film world are so close, like they're so close to each other, but they, they've never quite overlapped. And I think we're going to yeah. see that now as well is like, we're going to see a lot more production companies funding games. We're going to see a lot more movies, you know, working in tangent with games, which we've kind of been seeing uh, ideas of since Enter the Matrix. <laughs> yep. Yep. Which by the way, I loved the Matrix video game. I thought that was totally cool and such a great way to incorporate a game 
as a separate thing within the universe of the movies. Like yeah. that was made of a shit. I loved it. And like what I hated at the time was everybody just complained that it was like, oh, it's only like six hours long. And I'm like, yeah, well, the movie was an hour and a, or two hours 20. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, get over it. Like, just replay it again. You can do that yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. No, I um, loved that stuff. Also, I also really loved, you know, that same area. I think this is PS2. Um, was the Thing video game. Did you ever play that? So good. I still have it on my PC and okay. play it regularly. <laughs> it's so good. It's really cool. Like the mechanics that they have for trust, you know, and for yes. for sanity, like are really, really like progressive. Um, uh, that's one of the games that I, I feel like should be kind of more in rotation of people talking about great horror games and nobody yeah. really talks about it. It's it's funny because I haven't done my uh, I do uh, retrospectives on the channel as well like you know my my subjective top ten lists which just I, I was tempted at one point to start doing a like a game drafts but I said no I wouldn't I wouldn't steal uh, Clay and Ryan's thing but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no I, I I do top ten lists and I haven't done my PS2 one yet but the thing is showing up there I can guarantee you of that because it's one of my favorite uh, horror games of the PS2 era I think yeah it's, it's so yeah, clever it's, it's a really it's so clever. It's so clever. And it captures the feeling of the movie. Mm. You know, like it's, it'll be so easy to make a game where you're like McCready running through like hacking up things, you know? Yeah. And, but they didn't do, do that. Like they played in what the sandbox of the movie is, which is like fear and paranoia and, and trust. Um, and I think that's so smart. It's really cool. I totally agree. And um, yeah, so I... I want to ask uh, at the moment, actually, uh, I understand fully that so many of us uh, don't necessarily, there's projects that have fallen by the wayside and everything. I totally understand that everybody's kind of going through that. But is there anything you'd like to, to plug or talk about uh, on, the, on the channel that you want to draw people towards? Um, gosh, you know, right now I have a lot of things. This is the most obnoxious answer that I hate, but I have <laughs> a lot of things that I can't talk about. Out, but I've been very fortunate that I've been moving forward um, during this time frame. Um, however, I will say uh, I acted in a movie um, last summer that's in post right now called Mystery Spot. I'm very proud of it, um, and it's a uh, it's uh, I'm, I star in it with um, Lisa Wilcox from Nightmare on Elm Street Four and Five. Oh wow! Um, and um, it's a, a really cool uh, like Twilight Zony horror thriller is this um, the one that's set in a hotel it's set in a hotel in texas yeah. yeah um i'm very proud of it and i know that's in post right now and so you know keep your eyes and ears open for that because i think it's going to be really special um and then yeah I've, I've got other things coming you know but i'm, I'm just waiting slash excited for the return of like the festival circuit and yeah. the entertainment industry and things coming back and it will you know it'll just take a little bit of time um but i i know that a lot of very creative people uh, are are working very hard, you know, myself and yourself included, uh, in sort of prep for when we're finally able to actually make things again. Um, and I think we're going to have a big boom of some really cool stuff because I think people are really itching to to create once more. Um, and maybe that'll be true for video games too. You know? Uh, yeah, I'd say, uh, I'd I say you're right. Uh, yeah. Plus, uh, what, I'll, what I'll say as well is that, like, as I said, uh, Sequence Break is on Shudder. Uh, I believe Bliss is also on Shudder. I will we'll put a link in the description where you can check out all of those films. Uh, they're, they're all amazing. I say that from a genuine place because I don't champion stuff that I don't like. Um, and I like all three of those movies a lot. Well, especially, I, 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 love, I love everything, but Bliss is just, for some reason, it captured something in my heart and soul a certain way yeah. Yeah, some, totally. some media just does that you know and and what i love about this this thing we all love that is horror is at a festival you come out and you're like that film changed my life it was fucking incredible it's the best thing i've ever seen in my life and someone's like oh that was the biggest pile of shit i've ever seen <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah like all right <laughs> it's like wow what incredible polarizing reactions <laughs> but um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, Graham, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on and chat with me today um, about horror, games, movies, Echo the Dolphin. That's been my favorite thing on any interview so far. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, Patty, thank you so much. This is a blast. It's good to see you. You know, that, that's the main thing. It's just good 
see you and you know hang out and um you know i appreciate you 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 know being so kind about about all the the films and stuff and yeah man i'm i'm uh i don't know about you but i i might actually like pull out echo the dolphin tonight and play it <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that is it. that's gonna play be, it i don't know that's gonna be my next let's play series that's what i gotta do is echo the dolphin Perfect. <laughs> I don't good know luck it's fucking hard as shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, yeah no uh everybody this has been graham skipper uh he is wonderful give him all your love and all your likes and all your hugs <laughs> and uh uh thanks yeah thanks everybody but yeah it's good to, good to see everyone or hear everyone or not hear everyone how do you hear me i don't know <laughs> be safe out there as for always guys uh let's survive together and peace out and so there you have it folks that was my interview with the wonderful graham skipper um, i'm lucky to have met graham at fright fest a bunch of times over the years uh he's a fantastic actor a brilliant writer and director uh, i'm a huge fan of sequence break his movie it's available on shutter uh you should definitely check it out it's also available on amazon and everywhere else that you can grab films but uh he's been in some great 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 movies like um, almost human by joe bigas and the mind's eye also by joe bigas he's in all bigas films he's in bliss and vfw as well but he's in uh, beyond the gates by jackson stewart which is probably one of my top five films of the last decade i love it so much he's in that with chase williamson who also stars in his movie sequence break uh graham is just a wonderful guy who has a lot of passion for horror a lot of passion for horror gaming and uh just He's one of those people that goes out and champions people within the industry and I can empathize and relate with that a lot because that is what I like to do as well. Uh, so I want to give Graham the biggest thank you for taking the time to come on the show and talk with me and nerd out about horror games and Animal Crossing and all of that other good stuff. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, Graham. You are an absolute gem. Keep up the amazing work. And yeah, that's it for this uh, interview episode. Uh, we had another little uh, audio only interview go up yesterday with uh, Josh the Medic, which was great, absolutely fantastic and worth checking out. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying all this content. Uh, there's some changes coming to the the way that content is going to be done here on the channel with um, long plays being uh, streamed over on Twitch and then kind of uh, cut into highlight reels and released here on the tube. So that's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's been joining in on my live streams over the past couple of days. Really appreciate it. And yeah, uh, if you like what you're seeing here, please subscribe. Uh, it would go a hell of a long way. And also, if you want to keep up with the streams and what we're doing over there, head over to twitch.tv forward slash Let's Survive Paddy Plays. Um, and yeah, that would be absolutely amazing of you if you could throw me a follow over there as well. And yeah, that's it. So as per always, you guys, uh, I'm going to say what I always say, which is let's survive together and peace out.